John, we met, I remember vividly, 16th of June 2003. It was an extraordinary Arts Council conflag, like, you know, meet the, uh, well, I don't know what they would call it, meet the people, meet the Fockers, I've no idea, but there we are. We had uh, basically uh, a very interesting Arts Council officer, as then called, and he got this all together with David Pollard shouting at every opportunity, just give funds to Waterloo Press, fund Waterloo. But we had a completely different type of relationship as well from that because at that point you talked about survivor's poetry and that introduced me to the maelstrom I'm still living around at the moment. Yes, I was the chair I think then Simon mm -hmm. and as you'll be very aware, survivor's poetry, surviving as it has, sometimes runs into difficulties. My own theory is that's a lot to do with the clientele we serve. That clientele is often reflected in the people we employ. Um, survivors of mental distress, as the rubric has it for the organisation. And I think over the years, we've at least weathered the storms. So if I've plunged you into anything you weren't expecting, Simon, apologies. But I hope it's been the making of you in so many other ways. I'm sure it has. I've learned why accountancy isn't boring. And you told me at the time, uh, at the interview, and I think going up on the train, was this will be a roller coaster. I think that was a pretty apt conclusion. I discovered bills that uh, hadn't been paid for two years, cheques that had been put into place particularly for them to go and die by one of the people we know so well, and many other things. But Survivors has survived. It's been a remarkable organisation, and you have, in a sense, also parallel to that time as chair, you produced books with Waterloo Press because your own writing career which I know people were sort of wondering when it would start because of the remarkable work you produced and the work you produced in PN Review as a really fine critic. It's the first thing I came across your writing really was this extraordinarily good criticism of people like Craig Gray in PN Review. But then we have Letters to Lord Rochester, uh, imitation of basically Auden's letter to Byron. And then we had, of course, something infinitely bigger, not just your volume of poetry, but uh, this one, which I will certainly get right, was the name section the life interrupted yes you don't get to be chair of survivors poetry simon as i say without some acquaintance with the psychiatric <laughs> merry-go-round i had quite a sustained acquaintance i was variously in and out of those sort of old victorian asylums from the age of 16 onwards to about 28 really in and out and the out periods also comprised times in a homeless hostel therapeutic community streets, squats, and even uh, detained at Her Majesty's Pleasure. Why she takes pleasure in it, I don't know. Detaining people, um, Pentonville. I was on remand for three weeks for um, liberating some uh, bin liners and previously some white trousers. I thought the end of the world was coming and I needed my white trousers. The bin liners were incidental. But uh, black and white, John, you know. You, you may have a point there, Simon. Some Manichaean twist was going on in my deluded mind at the time. But... Uh, I then managed to swap, as you well know, one set of institutions for another. I went off to the University of East Anglia and I've been one way and another associated with about five universities. They've got points in common, all set in fine grassy parklands, big buildings, strange people at the top. Um, I suppose the old asylums, people thought they were kind of in retreat. Uh, universities, you're in rehearsal maybe. Uh, the, the other major difference is university, they often give you a piece of paper to tell you you can face the world. I think they used to do that in the old asylums. You used to get a discharge paper, maybe. Not sure. But uh, Foucault would be proud of me, Simon. Yeah. I mean, you're being given pieces of paper to go into a place, and other places are giving people they have papers to get out of it. Can't, you can't get away from it, can you? So it's of our existence, the paperwork's on, the closure um, work. Well, the publisher who brought you out, of course, is appropriately John Murray. And uh, that was interesting in itself. The man who actually rather did commit paper, as it were, to a grate and burned it uh, at the behest of others. But uh, fascinatingly enough, we, we looked at, uh, I remember one of my first uh, experiences of Survivor's Poetry was basically going through Roy Holland's uh, huge pile of Guardians that he piled, stockpiled for five years. And Stuart, A Life uh, Backwards was the title. And I remember this, but yours, A Life Interrupted, is laced with not misery, as I said, laughter and the extraordinary literary craft and the moving testaments and the bizarre humour 
but also an extraordinary journey through eventually married in, in St Paul, they basically married in St Martin's. Yes. And uh, that's that's where we end this particular memoir. It, it's it's a triumphal progress of, also, you, I would say, I'm not sure if it's in here, but this progress involves a sense of real gourmand cuisine guide to the best asylum food around the country, oh God, yes. for instance. Oh yes, well, I'm, I'm working on that guide even as we speak, Simon. They're closing them down before I can bring it out. This is the unfortunate twist I'm in. Uh, like mm. using your market niche. Yeah. Yes, yes indeed. No, uh, I got married in St Martin's, as you say, Simon, St Martin in the Fields. You've got to drink a lot of soup to get married there, Simon. But we had a fine day, and uh, like all good comedies, I suppose that book ends in a wedding, ends in a marriage. So, um, yeah, it could be seen in some ways as a grim document about my life, but in those places, as you well know yourself, Simon, it's humour and, you know, feeling that there's a sense of solidarity that keeps people going. So, uh, as much as there is uh, this cold-eyed, clear, I hope, uh, testimony about those sorts of places, there's also a few laughs thrown in there as well. And as you say, sometimes just the bizarreness that comes with the territory. John, your poetry, and I wonder about this, shows certain affinities with one or two other poets who were kind of bipolar bears, you described them, Robert Lowell, and poets much closer to home, uh, who we've read, and uh, sonnet writers who seem to be identifying the need for formal constraints with the chaos elsewhere. And the particularisation I found fascinating uh, we've got several poets, uh, I was thinking about to apostrophise them all, who've actually uh, written I mean, uh, a range of very intensely formal structures. And I don't know if you feel, obviously it's not something one consciously does, but it's, it's a temperament or a temper or a, a recourse or a resource of, of artistic profile, but your work is intensely patterned, extremely formal, immensely controlled, uh, in a sense, to produce that chaos. And you get this blue and white book element, you've got the, the, the blue book humour, the white book plangent tragedy, you've, you've got a whole register and we've got another book coming out, we've got brunch poems from 089, we've also got new work coming, do you feel your works, I mean sorry there's several throwing questions at you, the formal work, but also how do you feel it's changed, because you've got Frank O'Hara there too, you've got a whole bunch yes. of things. Like well I've been working away at all these vexed and seemingly cussed forms for a while, haven't I? I've got uh, Variously in brunch poems, triolets are they called? Are they triolets, triolets, toilets? Not, find out, not quite sure, no. <laughs> well, I've got one of them in there. I've got a sustainer, of course. I've got a couple of villanelles. Uh, I've got uh, various little invented forms of my own. The Irish are very proud of uh, something in the Irish they refer to as, I think the pronunciation is Dundirach, which is Irish for strict form. And I've got a sort of English attempt at that. You'll know full well that Luke at least tried something with um, sunlight in the heart, garden hardens and grows cold. I've got my own take on that. Uh, so I'll refer the gentle reader to a poem in that volume called Poem, yeah. one of two, just to confuse things, but they'll know it when they see it. Not poem one, poem two. But yes. But O'Hara then disrupts all this for me. O'Hara is the first person, the first poet I found who could play tennis with the net down in a way that still had a sense of aesthetic. I suppose cheekiness you'd have to say about a horror. So I warmed to him and um, tried to emulate him somewhat in uh, brunch poems. We're lucky in Brighton in that we have, well, Lee Harwood. And Lee Harwood, of course, knew a horror. So he was a lovely man. And then I met Donald Hall in Ireland, who equally uh, was an admirer of his. So it's funny how life takes you, you know. Yes. One minute I'm writing a letter to Lord Byron, the next I'm published by Byron's publishers. Who knows? This is true. Oh, we've got poets from, from Wendy Cope through to Sarah Ward, who took quite the distress. It's one last thought and trope that's picked up, I suppose, is Irish formalism. And a lot of people, Irish poets in particular, the diaspora, suffering in forms of mental distress. We can go down to people like Lowell, um, who are very different, but that element comes through. But the Ahara. Uh, element is something that really has developed over the years, yes. and uh, I've seen this blossom since about 2005. I think the best thing is to now introduce the world again to you, uh, although it doesn't need too much introduction, you're quite out there already, but uh, it would be lovely if you read a poem or two. Well, thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. This is the little Dandurak poem I referred to, called Poem. 
Moonlight on the river shivers, silver on the ripples. The river winds and wanders under hills through villages too many to be numbered. Daylight dawns as highlands islands brighten in the sunshine, and cottages just waking, taking turns to stretch and yearn, to rise and be awakened. Love light in the meadow shadows dances out for romance later in the glooming, mooning hand in hand through England's sweetest evening swooning. Delight in the couples, supple, lovely in the puddly churchyards of midsummer slumber, hearken to the dark of night. World is full of wonder. A poem from the end of Brunch Poems. This one's called Shades. Through all the straggly back streets, I chased my old ghost down. Through sea mists and through murk, I search this haunted town. I hear them singing in the pubs. I see them in the parks. The faces I have loved and lost. Old friends, old spars, old larks. By shore I known by shelter, I hear them softly call. I seek them down each winding way chase each muffled footfall. They beckon me. They tell me that I will get what I am owed. But they all know and love the playboy of the Western world.